Welcome back to the channel, heart friends and fellow students of the great mystery. I'm Lily Rose, and today I'm here to tell you some stories and talk a little bit about one of the constellations in our night sky, Ursa Major, the great she-bear. So if I were Jimmy Kimmel and I was out on the street taking submissions from passers-by on the streets of Portland, and my question was, Name me a constellation that you can go out there and point out and identify in the night sky right now. My guess is that the overwhelming winner of that answer would be the Big Dipper, right? Either the Big Dipper or the Little Dipper, unless we like someone was a show off, right? But like the go-to response would probably be the Big Dipper. And the reason for this, although there, are, there may be a few, one of the reasons for this is because the Big Dipper and the Little Dipper, along with a handful of constellations, Draco, Cephas, Cassiopeia, these are the circumpolar constellations. And what that means is that um, they rotate around the fixed point of Polaris, the North Star, right? Well, actually the entire uh, firmament rotates around Polaris, right? But the circumpolar constellations are arranged such uh, in, that their positioning in the starry firmament never dips below the horizon. So that no matter the time of year, they're always visible in our night sky. So for many days, ancient, ancient days, you know, as far back as time goes, the, within the night sky, guarding over our night skies has always been the great she-bear along with a handful of her companions, the circumpolar constellations, night after night after night. And so, um, you know, definitely probably the most famous constellation. And you can see the seven stars here in, in Ursa Major, these are the Big Dipper. And the North Star Polaris is part of Ursa Minor, which is the and part of the Little Dipper. It's actually the tip of his tail, okay? And so, I want to think about this for a minute because this idea of a pivot point, right? And that Polaris is a pivot point for the entire geocentric universe, the entire starry firmament rotating around this stationary point. It's actually very interesting, right? And you think about, I'm thinking about those star pictures that you see that are like the swirls of stars like this, right? And that center point, right? Polaris, the North Star. You know, it makes me think of the Sufis. Um, well, actually, first it makes me think of a pivot point in dance, right? Like, as a dancer, you're taught, one of the very first things you're taught when you're taught pivot turns is to pick a point on the wall. And that point is your focus. And you turn your entire body. And the last thing you do is you snap your head around and focus right back to that point of focus. And this keeps you from getting dizzy. So, you know, spinning like this makes me think of the whirling dervishes and it makes me wonder, do they pick a spot on the wall like a dancer? Maybe, maybe they do that, but maybe they also, and probably very likely, they also do something else, which is to center within the center of their being. You know, they may even close their eyes and find the center of their being, which is in Sufi language towards the one moving towards the one in the center of their being and using that as a pivot point to keep their balance. You know, I know when I practice yoga that I'm not looking at a point on the wall to center myself and balance. I'm, I'm looking for a point within myself that's very deep within myself and toward the one. 
And so, you know, maybe Sufis do a combination of both of these things. I don't know. Uh, but regardless, this idea of a pivot point uh, of the universe and this idea of kind of a cosmic connection between the, that center of, of our own being towards the one and, and the center of, of the firmament, the, the pivot point of the firmament, you know, that there's some macrocosmic, microcosmic relationship, that there's some thread of connection between those two, right? Uh, you can sort of feel that energy, at least I can. And so uh, it, this, this idea of the North Star and a pivot point makes me think of the term true north, right? Like you want to go head towards your true north. And I can kind of see Johnny Depp with his little uh, compass going in circles. What is it that I really want, right? Like head towards that. But uh, true north is kind of a trendy business entrepreneur term. That's actually maybe not even trendy anymore. It's actually a little past date, but it was trendy, you know, five, seven years ago. And uh, it was an idea in business where, you know, we started having sort of ethical, moral, morality imposed upon business kind of in the beginning of that sort of surge in business departments. Uh, somebody wrote a book called True North. Uh, the definition of which, coming from Huffington Post, apparently they've now written two more True North follow-up books. Of course they have. Uh, but I don't, you know, I don't know how popular they were. But True North was really pretty popular, I think. And um, so the definition is True North is your orienting point, your fixed point in a spinning world that helps you stay on track as a leader. It's derived from your most deeply held beliefs, values, and principles that you lead by. It's your internal compass, unique to you, representing who you are at your deepest level. Like, right? Like, that's actually really admirable. I didn't mean to downplay the publication. And this is uh, from Huffington Post, and I'll post the, it, the link in the show notes. But, you know, your true north, your orienting point as a leader. And, um, yeah, it's just interesting to think about the, the connection between Polaris uh, as a true north, uh, you know, it's the North Star and, and this innermost point of our own true North or our compass and, and the, the thread of relationship between these two. Um, I'm going to tell you the story of Callisto, which is the story of the great bear from Greek mythology. Uh, as Bernadette Brady points out, like uh, <laughs> she kind of says it in a funny way. Of course, she's a woman writer and she's, a, she's an excellent writer. She's got a great contribution to the field of astrology. Uh, everyone seems to really like her book, The Eagle and the Lark, which is uh, especially the section on the sorrow cycles or the eclipses. Um, and I agree, I think it's a great publication. Um, and so I, I got this book, The Fixed Stars, mostly because I'm interested in the mythology of the fixed stars and learning more about the constellations uh, and also in teaching my son that in Waldorf. Uh, and speaking of that, the story of Callisto is going to be coming from this astronomy book um, curriculum here from Live Education. And the writer here, Bruce Bischoff, has sort of created, you know, melded a few different versions of the story. So kind of taking from him uh, in a rough sense. Um, but I was going to say that Bernadette Brady, you know, she kind of points out that at, the, at by the point we reach the Greek mythology, that Callisto, like this, this constellation of the she bear has been downgraded to a wood nymph that is a conquest of Zeus, right? And she kind of says it in a funny way, but that this is actually an archetype, a feminine archetype that has been uh, part of the mythos for that, that way that much predates Greek mythology, right? From Babylonian culture and from the Vedas even before that, okay? Uh, but nonetheless, the story of Calypso is, or Callisto is probably uh, the most intact story that we have of the great she-bear, especially as it relates to Western culture. And uh, so the story goes that Callisto was uh, a princess of Arcadia, the kingdom of Arcadia. And that um, she, she wasn't a typical princess though. She, you know, she didn't, she wasn't interested in beautiful clothes and, uh, you know, warm baths and saunas and being waited on by her ladies in waiting and, and kind of doing friz frivolous things like dance parties and these kinds of things. She was actually more interested in, uh, and, and sort of the deeper things of life. We know uh, from other studies, at least uh, we can see through, through the way symbology works out that when we talk about hunting deer, uh, that we're actually talking about um, 
about going after, going out into the wilderness and, and looking for, for the deeper sense and meaning of reality and looking for those sort of sacred teachings. And that the bow, you know, of Sagittarius is sort of that philosophical mind that reaches towards those teachings and, and the deer representing that gentle nature uh, and, and sort of the Christ-like or the Buddha-like nature. We know the Buddha gave his first teaching at Deer Park. You know, so these symbols are, are in all of the different world religions. So when I talk about uh, Cal Callisto being a huntress and going out into the wilderness to, to hunt deer, uh, I hope that it doesn't offend our vegan sense, you know, sentimentalities because we're not actually talking about meat here. We're talking about something else. It's a symbol. And so Callisto, though, you know, she was sort of a tomboy and she was very interested in, in out, going out for the hunt. She loved the adventure of it and she loved going out in the wilderness and, and getting herself dirty and looking, doing something more fulfilling and meaningful to her than uh, dressing up pretty and uh, smiling and, and entertaining courtiers, etc. And so much to her father's dismay because her, his father wanted another heir. He wanted a grandchild and he wanted Callisto to marry. Um, but she, you know, of course, wasn't all that interested in that. And so suitors would come to visit the palace and um, she would be given these pretty silk dresses and things. And the suitor would come and they couldn't find her anywhere. And, you know, hours would pass, even days sometimes. And she'd come dragging in with some pelt of fur you know, draped over her shoulders, a little bit bloody and dirty on her face and her feet, and she's all oily and stinky from sleeping in the woods, and she would quickly run, uh, turn suitors away, right? They would run. Uh, but she didn't mind because she didn't want to get married. Um, so, but one day, Callista was out hunting in the woods, and she spied a deer, and she recognized through her prowess that, you know, in order to, to nab this deer, she was going to have to kind of go a back way and, and come around and then you know she finally got in position and came up on this deer in a clearing and she went to string back her bow and 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 an arrow whizzed right by her ear and she whipped around because she was angry because whoever this other hunter was had had taken her prize had like you kind of taken her parking place right you know like you're getting ready to park somewhere and the person somebody pulls in it kind of it makes you angry and so she whips around to see that it's artemis and Artemis was the goddess of the hunt and, uh, and the role model guru teacher, uh, you know, the person that, that Callisto most look up, looked up to in the world. And so Artemis, you know, uh, showers her praise upon Callisto and uh, recognizes her as a priestess of the order and offers her a position of belonging within sort of their uh, priestly goddess caste, her whatever, their retinue, and uh, says, you know, come back in a month's time, at the time of, of the next full moon, and, um, and you can join our order. Go tell your parents, go, go make your arrangements and come back. And uh, she says, but you, you must know that you can never marry, and you can never have children, and that we are, our devotion is to uh, something beyond that sort of um, ensnarement and entanglement. And so uh, she agrees wholeheartedly and she heads off. But, you know, as she's making her way home, she gets a little bit sleepy and she decides to lay down on the earth and take a nap. Well, the forces of generation of nature being what they are and as they sap and unfurl and sort of, you know, the richness and abundance that that is, is characterized by an energy named Zeus. And Zeus unfurled himself and curled all around Callisto as she slept, with the forces of generation being what they are, and uh, snuck away. And Callisto, un unbeknowing to herself, found herself pregnant, right? So a month later when she returned, it was obvious that she was with child. She had never... Um, laid with Zeus that she knew of, but the truth was that Zeus had impregnated her. And so um, Callisto lost everything. She wasn't able to become part of the order, uh, of the retinue, and she wasn't able to become um, a part of the, of the priestly group that uh, the, of nuns or, or servants or goddesses that were hanging around Artemis. And, and in that moment, she, she lost everything. 
um, except she gained a son, right? So she went home and had this boy Arcus, and um, who grew to be a fabulous hunter and who grew to be stunning and you know a beautiful boy. But you know there's some sort of tragedy in Arcus's life because at a certain point when he was a boy, his mother left and never returned, and no one really knew what happened to her. It was thought that maybe she eventually went to join Artemis, or maybe she went to find the son's father, is what people thought, and she never returned. But the truth of the matter is that Hera, Zeus's wife, who was very jealous, as the boy began to grow, noticed the likeness of Zeus in the boy and knew what had happened because her husband, Zeus, as Elijah calls him, thunder cloud, thunder cloud, often came down and did these sleazy things, partnering with uh, mortal women and creating babies. And Hera, you know, she, Hera was insanely jealous. And, and so she tur turned Callisto into a bear and said, saying, as she, you know, turned her into a bear, you who love the hunt now become the hunted. And so Callisto, knowing, you know, she was a, a great huntress, and so she knew the ways of hunters, and so she knew how to keep away from the arrow, but it meant a life of hiding. And so she pretty much stayed hidden all of the time, but there was this one day when she was, you know, foraging for berries or whatever she was doing, and she saw a boy a grown boy coming out. He was a hunter through the clearing and she recognized this boy as her son, Arcus. And she filled with tears and she forgot herself for a moment and sort of lumbered out. Oh. You know, you can just imagine. And, and, but she forgot she was a bear for a second, just seeing her son and how beautiful he was. And she missed him so much and she loved him so much. And, uh, but Arcus didn't know that was his mom. And so he, you know, drew back his bow to shoot her and protect himself, but also he was a hunter. And in that moment, Zeus reached down and sw swooped the two of them up into the heavens and, and to become constellations. And so that's the story of the great she-bear, the mother, Callisto, and the son, the, the little bear, the bear cub. Um, but also um, there's there, um, the son, Arcus, tends to get two archetypes, the little bear, but also the hunter, Booties. And so we can see that in one sense, he's a son, of the mother, but in another sense, he's a man and a hunter of booties. Okay, so uh, yeah, so that's the traditional story of Callisto and the story of of the great she bear. Okay, and so um, it's interesting, you know, to know to to think about how uh, the mother guards her son, right, and her son is the fixed point of the universe where all the divine light streams through, and she's there receiving it and filtering it down uh, to to the earth below or to to the the stationary plane of the earth below okay and so in, in esoteric astrology the constellation of the great bear is very important for this reason okay it's understood that these seven stars of the big dipper are the seven rishis or the seven seers the seven bears and that the light, the divine light actually streams in through that fixed point. It's like a hatch opening up into the greater cosmos, you know, or, or the state or the geocentric system. And the light filters in through the North Star and filters down through these seven stars. And it's, there's actually a, a trinity, um, a triplicity of, of constellations that the energy works through, okay? Um, it's actually understood, though, that, that as the light filters down, it then hits these stars, and then it hits a triplicity of, of constellations, like the seven rays, right? These rays are very important in esoteric astrology. And that hits a triplicity of constellations, and then it hits a triplicity of planets, okay? So the energy, you know, is, is splintered in, in, in a couple different ways as it makes its progression, right? Um, and so and I, that makes me think of a triplicity of consonants, of, of zodiac, zodiacal uh, constellations. Um, and then it makes me think of, of a triplicity of vowels, you know. So th we begin to see spells and words and gematria and uh, things coming into being in this way, right? So that the, that the physical arising actually is happening in this way, filtering in this way from the North Star through the seven rishis of the great bear and through these triplicities into the arising okay but as i mentioned 
that there's actually a, a triplicity of constellations that the energy is understood to be working through in its entirety, okay? And so it's like the Trinity. It's like the uh, Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva, okay? And so the three constellations are the Great Bear, Sirius, and the Pleiades, where it's like a red shift of Brahma coming through the Great Bear. This is the creative aspect of the universe. Then there's a preserving aspect of the universe happening with, um, with Sirius and connected to, to the, the constellation or planetary star system of Sirius. And then um, the, the rarefication or the blue shift, the Shiva movement happening with the Pleiades, okay? And then back up, you know, presumably through this hatch and, and back down, you know, so there's a, a, a triangular motion of light happening in that way. And, and just kind of backing up half a second, that, um, that Brahma aspect coming down through the Great Bear is further elaborated by the, by, the planet, by the constellations and the planets, right? The double triplicities. And then it's carried along a preservation through the Sirius star system and then uptake back rarefication through the Pleiadian star system, which is interesting. Okay, so let's point at the Pleiadian one first because we know that this uh, moment in Scorpio, which is, it's talked about in the esoteric literature a lot, that this time at the full moon of during Scorpio, so the full moon is in Taurus, that this is the time um, where we slay the dragon, and then that would be the time when the Pleiades when the Pleiades are on the rise, right? The full moon would be happening in the Pleiades. Okay, and this is the time when we slay the dragon, and the uptake of the energy happens, right? It's a time that of death in the fall that precedes rebirth. Okay, so we know there's a lot of confluence in the esoteric literature around this. Uh, also, we know about the star Sirius, right? The, the, the pres preservation system, which points at what, what are we preserving? What is this motion? What are we doing here, right? What, are the, what is the purpose? It happens in the, in the preservation moment. And we know that the star system Sirius is very connected to consciousness and the progression of consciousness. If we look, there's a video online that Santos Bonacci is talking about uh, the star system Sirius and, and the, uh, our sun, and that how they're in a the binary relationship, the Sirius B, I think it is, that, you know, and the relationship of the two of them, and that when they're at their closest points, that this means a golden age. But as they move away from each other, that this indicates like an iron age as the, at the furthest point. So, but that we're at a very fortunate point in our consciousness as these planets have both turned a corner and are heading back towards each other again, which means, indicates the ending of the Kali Yuga, the ending of the Iron Age, and that we're moving closer towards a Golden Age, which means that the sort of foggy, dismal uh, confusion of our consciousness, of deceit, etc., uh, will begin to, the dross will begin to burn off in an inner sense of gnosis and light and knowing will help us to clear that confusion and that we'll begin to know both ourselves and our purpose as well as, uh, as our connection to the divine beings uh, that guide us and, and, and our sort of progression of purpose here on this planet uh, in the golden age, right? And so, uh, and, and then additionally, we know that uh, taking from this book, The Serious Mystery, right? Uh, that, that there's a, there's a, that there are, um, the two, there are three stars in the Sirius star system, A, B, and C, uh, that they have 50 year orbits and that there's something about a twinning of these that would indicate royal rule and that that was a Hecate or Hecate, uh, but that the actual festivals were celebrated in 60 year increments. And there's a question of why 60? And you know, in the initial writing of the book, he didn't know, but he puts an appendix on the end. And I think all of this is a little fuzzy, but at the same time there, we have indications uh, that we're following the clues uh, to recover our spiritual heritage, right? And so he points out that, oh, did I undo the, I think I did, I think I took the, um, bookmark out. Oh, here it is. So he talks about, though, that this, this 60 is a number of, um, of uh, conjunctions between Jupiter and Saturn. Okay, so Jupiter and Saturn make conjunctions every 20 years. One would be here, 20 years, 20 years, and then 20 years. But then when it comes back around to 60 years, it's just a fraction of a degree off from the original spot, right? And then same down here and same down here. So slowly, it's turning 
and moving into a pattern like this that happens every 33,600 30, years, okay? And it's interesting because we're like on the eve of a new Jupiter and Saturn conjunction, right? It's going to happen in 2020 in Capricorn. And that's, it looks to be on Wikipedia, it looks to, that has a list of the conjunctions, uh, my excellent occult resource, Wikipedia, but it looks to be that it's a, it's the ending, it's a third of, of a conjunction. So we're moving on back to a new cycle, right? It was interesting. But uh, nonetheless, that 33,600 number relates to an epoch of consciousness. We know that. And so we, and we also know that it relates to the sorrow cycle, again, eclipses, and the way that those move across, uh, across the firmament and, th and through the geocentric universe and back to the start points at the poles, right? So there's energy in a sorrow cycle, that, and, and that this is from Bernadette Brady's other book, which is The Eagle and the Lark, and she talks about how a sorrow cycle moves from one pole to the other, and each eclipse is like... You know, each eclipse is not necessarily in a line. It's like there are certain eclipses that, that and it moves, a, the eclipse cycle, sorrow cycle moves from one pole to the other, okay? And that the progression of this is maybe roughly 3,600 years. There's some connection here. So, you know, I see eclipse cycles as being imprints that are imprinting the lessons and bringing the energy into through this hatch down through the, you know, and filtering it down in. And, uh, and the point that I'm getting at here is that Sirius, the preservation, the Vishnu aspect of this trinity um, and this, this triangular of constellations in esoteric astrology is obviously related to consciousness, progression of soul purpose, you know, our lessons and the quickening of our understanding so that we can uh, spiritualize uh, this planet and realize our spiritual purpose, so make it a sacred planet and move on to the next uh, the next level, whatever that may be. Uh, you know, in the esoteric understanding, that's kind of along the lines of, of where we're going and the reason that we're here. Uh, that, that we're intimately connected with the number, like a hierarchy of beings, all at different levels of spiritual progression. Uh, some planets are sacred planets. They've already made the leap, right? But some are not. And so, you know, we're all sort of on a level of, of, of evolution, spiritual evolution or soul progression, right? And so we can see with Sirius that that's what's going on here, that that's, that's the, the common thread that, of, of the preservation, what we're working towards. Then the uptake of the energy happens through the Pleiades in the fall with the, uh, you know, um, scorpion biting the leg of Orion, etc., and so it's just very interesting. It's interesting to note how these constellations have been talked about in, in, in antiquity and, and how, how this energetics is working and relating in esoteric science and in, um, in the occult literature. Okay, um, but, but most interesting of all, I think, you know, is the fact that, um, okay, and so I'm going to point at it from this, from this angle, which is very, did I bring that? Oh, I did bring this book in. Okay, so there's this book here called Crispin, and Elijah, and I did not expect this book to be good. I expected it to be horrible, and Elijah and I to be, Elijah to like groan when I was reading it to him, because we're studying the Middle Ages right now, and it's a, it's a set in the Middle Ages, but this book is a page turner for sure. It's like a murder mystery, and it's like, was really good. Um, but it has nothing to do with Earth, Ursa Major, except for that it does, because um, one of the characters in here is named Bear. And he seems in the beginning like he's going to be a bad character. But I looked at Elijah and I was like, because ah. we keep having all these synchronicities around bears and, the, and Ursa Major and the she-bear, which is why I, I was urged to make this video, right? And I was like, Elijah, I bet you anything, he turns out to be a, a mothering character to this, to this child, that he turns out to be a good guy. And that's exactly the way that it went. And that's because the great bear is understood to be the protector of, this, of her child, this North Star, right? And so the additional sort of the last piece of kind of information that we need here is that we ran across this video and Elijah was saying the night before, I mean, the way things work out, you know, like synchronicity, it's my favorite because that's how I know that I'm on the path and that's how I know that the Great Spirit's talking to me and leading me towards certain revelations and understandings. But the night before, Elijah goes to my mom and I, who's the king of the jungle? And like, he really didn't know. I can't remember how he said it, but it was just like, who's the mightiest animal? And we, my mom and I were both like, ha, huh, duh, it's the lion, right? Like everybody knows that. 
the lion's the king of the jungle. Okay, end of conversation. And the next day, Elijah and I were looking through videos on YouTube about, I think about Hildegard because, um, and about St. Francis of Sissy and a couple of the other like uh, monastics of the Middle Ages. And we ran across this video about the bear and about how the bear used to be um, the most um, for understood to be the most ferocious and the most like, you know, strongest and king of the jungle, but it also used to be associated with royalty that, you know, now you think of, of royalty, you think of the lion, right? So now when we think of, of royalty, right, we think of the lion, we think of Richard the lion heart, right? And, and definitely the lion is the most regal of all the animals. We even think of Regulus, right? The fixed star, uh, as being the royal star. But apparently this is propaganda because according to this writer and blogger, his name is Arith Harger, uh, and I will definitely point to his video and his, um, his blog because I found it, it's amazing. Like I would never have known this if it wasn't for this writer. And he's, a, he's sort of really into Celtic religion and he's super smart. And he talks about how in the Middle Ages that there was uh, an intentional assault against the bear as a symbolism uh, and that how they it was replaced with the lion and that's because of the close connections of the bear to uh, the matriarchal religion of paganism and uh, let's see I'll just read the quote that he wrote um, to the church during medieval times the bear was the personification of evil ferocity and chaos because the creature lived in the dense almost unreachable forests the forests were the dwelling places of the pagans in truth, the forests were the places the pagans considered to be sacred once, but now it was their refuge from the horrible acts of forced Christianization. But the bear started to enter into Christian mythology in another way. It became the symbol of the divine dominating chaos because only the ones, the only ones who could contact with these terrible creatures and turn them into docile animals were the hermits. Those who would seek the most inhospitable places to live in solitude for spiritual reasons. Only through their faith and connection with the divine power of God could they do such a thing, turning the ferocious beast into a docile companion. Thus the bear became the symbol of the victory of the divine over chaos. Well, and he also brings up the fact that it becomes, uh, that it used to be the symbol of, um, of royalty, the bear. And it's interesting because as part of our like medieval studies, we're also reading uh, King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table and also the Parsifal stories, which, you know, Arthur, Arthur means bear, okay? And so King Arthur is not really, was not really a king of, of England, right? Like this is a, a legend, uh, but Arthur is set up as, um, as, the, as, the, as the matriarchal king, okay? He's given his power by the lady of the lake, uh, sort of coming out of the lotus flower and handing him his sword. And he and the Knights of the Round Table are understood to be the protectors of the matriarchal religion which is in contrast to the patriarchal religion of the lion, um, of, the, of the forced Christianization. So, you know, there's something happening here where, you know, they're, they're, they're doing these crusades and they're burning all the heretics at the stake, but and anyone who's a pagan and opposes this forced Christianization, but they're going so far as to like change the symbolism and make the bear um, public enemy number one, you know, just, you know, for lack of a better term. So it's just very interesting because the, the point is, is that no matter how they, the, the church and the, and the, the patriarchal religion and, and the, the, the greed of kings looking for power and dominion try to wipe away our spiritual heritage. They try to wipe away these things from our consciousness that they're so important to our, to our psyche, right? They try to wipe these things away. But at the same time, like, they're, they can't really wipe it away. The, the understanding of the great bear, the great she-bear guarding this entrance point is, is not, it's, it's written in the sky. It's not something that we, can, that we can hide away. And so that's why astrology and astronomy become so important because the things of the earth, the material things that we find can be corrupted, they can be changed. You know, they're, they're intentionally changing this dense physical uh, evidence that we find, this scientific materialism, that
that we need to rely on a more numinous and a more light um, way of seeking knowledge and it's there right before our plain eyes. The great bear guarding the entrance point for the divine light as it comes into the geocentric system. Okay, And I'm, I'm, I'm going to end by, by telling you one more thing that relates to the Jupiter and, and Saturn conjunctions, right, of Sirius, that's like the point of, of what we're doing here, the, the preservation aspect, the Vishnu aspect of the arising. And that is that, okay, so this is the mother and this is the child, right? And so the understanding is that the Jupiter conjunction with Saturn is the castration of Saturn. And we know that the, in the mythology that first uh, Uranus is castrated by Kronos and then Kronos, Saturn is castrated by Jupiter, right? And that, um, and that, that it's the mother that urges this and puts her son Zeus on the throne, right? But in a deeper sense, in a more matriarchal sense, that's still sort of a patriarchal take in the, in the, in the Greek religions. But we also know that, you know, Osiris was also castrated and that his son Horus was made from the castrated um, parts <laughs> and that Isis, Isis, the great she-bear, put her son Horus or the Christ figure, Mary and Christ, on, you know, as the pivot point of the universe and that she guards this entry point and exit point, you know, of, of the entire arising, okay? And so in this way, uh, we can see that, that connected through our mythology and um, through what the visible uh, evidence in our night sky and our connection to the, the cosmic realms of light that we can see the real story and the true story of, um, of our spiritual heritage, uh, but also of sort of like the point of what we're doing here, right? Which is this uh, progression of consciousness. And, 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 you know, we can see the true religion, right? We can see the true religious teachings, uh, which are not that which is preserved in the Bible, where they're like intentionally replacing animals. I'm not looking at the. I'm not looking at a lion guarding this north star, her son. I'm looking at the great she bear, uh, guarding her son, the little bear. So, uh, I think that's all I want to say for today. So, uh, thanks for being here. Please do like and subscribe. Um, I appreciate you taking the time to watch this video. I hope that you got something out of it and uh, hopefully you learned something. I look forward to hearing and uh, receiving and appreciating your comments. And um, yeah, thanks for being here. Be a good family. Find the others. Be kind. <laughs> and I'm adding a new one. Play your note. I love you guys. Bye. Take care. <laughs>